Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm just going to introduce the speakers. Us donem la benvinguda a Caixa Fòrum Macaia. De seguida començarà l'activitat. Si us plau, comproveu que teniu els telèfons mòbils apagats. Moltes gràcies. Les damos la bienvenida a Caixa Fòrum Macaia. En breves momentos començarà l'activitat. Por favor, comproven que sus teléfonos mòbils estan apagados. Muchas gràcies. Thank you, everyone, and welcome to the launch of the first indicator report of the Lancet Countdown in Europe. I'm Rachel Lowe, ICREA Research Professor at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center and the Director of the Lancet Countdown in Europe. And we're delighted to start the session with some opening remarks from the Director of the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, Matteo Valero, and from the Director of the Barcelona Institute for Global Health, Anthony Placencia. Thank you very much. Bon dia a tothom. Thank you, uh, Rachel, for introducing me. It's my pleasure to be here in this event organized by the Lancet, IS Global, and BSC. Uh, as you know, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center is the Spanish national lab in supercomputing. So let me tell you that uh, we were not created from the scratch. We started working in this topic in '84. I convinced the Spanish government, the Catalan government, and the UPC, my university, when I came from Madrid, I am a telecommunication engineer from Madrid, to devote resources to create the first research center on parallel computer, probably one of the first, uh, the first one in Spain, probably one of the first in Europe, okay? We were step by step, and in 04, the same partner proposed us to be uh, at grade to, the, to be the Spanish National Lab. So let me tell you one thing. When we were in the, this small uh, parallel computer center at, at UPC, we were a computer science department. I am a communication engineer and a computer scientific. And I strongly believe that the future supercomputer will be, uh, will be helping the society to solve problems. So I decided to create three departments, engineering, life science and earth sciences. So we, from the very beginning, strongly believe in the use of this computer uh, to solve real problem, real problem. So we have these three departments, but let me tell you another thing in this direction. Uh, now you know that we are waiting for the Mare Nostrum 5. Uh, we will start uh, uh, installing the machine in December. The machine will be available in uh, June. And we could have spent all the money just buying a, a machine, just to be number, we could be number two in the world in the famous top 500 list. No, we didn't that. We were thinking that this machine should be used for uh, producing digital twins. And we had, because we have enough power, enough memory, we have artificial intelligence, so the good ingredient for cook, a very good paella, okay? very different paellas, no? the digital twins. And we are collaborating with many institutions, for example, with the city hall, with the smart cities. We are collaborating with many research centers in the human digital twin. It's a very big challenge. And we are very active in the, air in the, in the destination Earth. In fact, uh, Professor Paco Doblas is in Helsinki now with the, the team, the partners, uh, talking about that. Okay. And believe me that the machine we, we, uh, uh, we are going to install 
is the perfect machine to execute the destination nest. I, I, I could give you information about uh, the technical details. I am a computer architect. I, I know anything about uh, medicine or, or climate change. But it's the perfect machine, probably in Europe, to, uh, but not just for, because we have different kind of processor we are going to have, and this is very important, around 800 petabyte of storage. You need plenty of data. The human uh, digital twin needs plenty of data from uh, uh, hospital, okay? So we are 800 people, 700 doing research for the department, and the, the, the unique uh, characteristic of BSC is that we work together. And then when I saw the title for this uh, health and earth science, they are working since uh, many times ago, the people from both department, when we are talking about health, uh, climate change, uh, destiny, uh, uh, quality of the air, uh, we have the uh, uh, engineering department working. So all the two departments, life science and uh, uh, um, uh, life science and earth science are working together in this topic and also the department of uh, engineering. And let me tell you that I am very proud of having Rachel and his team and her team join us. So thank you for taking the decision. I think you are always right <laughs> taking the decision. So I would like you to enjoy. Uh, I, I need to leave, unfortunately, because this is an important topic for the society. We have always in mind the society. Let me tell you that uh, just for the chapel, until now, more than 300,000 people visit us that every year we have more than 6,000 people from the, from the schools and we try to convince them that the uh, quality of the air, climate change, personalized medicine, anything is very important for the society. And our lemma is do things in favor of the society and this is one of them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Valero. Uh, I'm Antoni Plasencia, Director of the Barcelona Institute for Global Health. Uh, and we are really very pleased to be here. Uh, and uh, I think it's time for two things, one for an acknowledgement and second for renewed commitments. Let me start with the renewed commitments. Uh, I think that most of us here, all of us here share a, a few aspects. One is that we, with the climate crisis, we are dealing with the most, undoubtedly, the most important global health challenge uh, of the century. And actually, I'm paraphrasing a, a sentence from the report, a heading from the report, where it says a public health, uh, ch the public health challenge of the future. So that's uh, the starting point. The second is that we need a sense of urgency uh, to precisely uh, uh, redirect uh, uh, the, not only the diagnostics of the situations, but the solutions and their implementation. And that's where science, but not only science and innovation uh, by themselves, but that together with science we need, of course, the uh, early implication uh, of uh, policy, of policy makers, of politicians and society at large. So this continuum, this uh, virtuous circle, which is not always very virtuous, I have to say, so there's room for improvement, and definitely what we are sharing today is one of the examples of how the virtuous circle can be mostly in the sense of a tool in, uh, under a, a set of indicators, of indicators and a strategy behind that that, need, that will help precisely to accelerate transformation and, and engagement or engagement and transformation. So is global, as you know, uh, as it, it, its name says, we see uh, health as uh, a global issue. Health is global. Uh, and uh, that means precisely many of the elements that I, I just shared. And in uh, this uh, effort uh, clearly matches our commitment with uh, this global vision. So health needs to be seen beyond borders and uh, beyond political, uh, beyond physical and political uh, borders. Also uh, because it meets our strategic priorities around climate and health. 
our planetary health uh, orientation also increasing and uh, in de de increasingly deploying, and also preparedness, preparedness and uh, response for resilience, for recovery uh, um, uh, in, in societies at large. So we really feel very proud, and uh, it's not only my pride, but it's, uh, it's largely the, the contribution of the many people, and the, here I go into the acknowledgement uh, part, which is uh, a very important. Uh, and uh, uh, first of all, uh, from uh, the East Global people that have contributed, Professor Catherine Ton, uh, who is co-director of this uh, um, countdown, uh, the European uh, uh, Countdown, uh, Professor Jose Maria Anto, co-chair of this uh, platform, and our former uh, scientific director uh, at this global. But also, let me <clears throat> thank the people from the Lancet Count Countdown Global, uh, Professor Antonio Costello, an old friend uh, of of this global, and the, uh, the, it's right the director also, Marina Romanello, and uh, and uh, the chair of this uh, 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 European uh, Lancet Countdown. Professor Maria, Maria Nilsson. And of course, we are very pleased uh, as we are today expressing here uh, our, uh, a new uh, opportunity, a, a new uh, collaboration with uh, BCC, and most notably with Professor Rachel Lowe uh, in her position uh, uh, in BCC, but also a long time is global, part of the East Globalian community. So as we were just saying, this is about collaboration for transformation without borders. And this is what science, but not only science, but the other stakeholders. So uh, just uh, uh, we have the conviction that uh, in the face of these, uh, of the challenges of the Anthropocene, I was just reading someone, someone already uh, but, uh, uh, tagging this as the Catastrophocene, and this is not humorous, but again, it needs to bring in the overall social picture and social perception the importance of, of, of this urgency. Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, this importance of, the, of uh, being able to bring knowledge, uh, in, in this case, to bring uh, tools, and it's not always easy in the, in the, uh, from the scientific community to you know, get in the dirt of uh, uh, having to develop uh, tools and dealing with other uh, stakeholders from other, from other areas that are not science and, you know, uh, how is this going to be acknowledged in my scientific career and so on. So all these people uh, have, uh, again, I want to, uh, to underline the importance of this engagement for, for, for transmit. Uh, for transformation. So with this, uh, I wish you a really a very productive event. We will follow this. Let me also thank on behalf of all of us, all the institutions that are here, from the Catalan government, from the local uh, government, from also the, the metropolitan area, uh, and, and of course, all the institutions that you represent here. So thank you and, uh, and good luck. Thank you so much, Matteo and Antoni, for your excellent opening remarks, and we really appreciate the support of the BSE and IS Global in our collaboration. So we're next going to hear from Professor Francisco Doblos Reyes. Unfortunately, he can't be with us in person today because he is in Helsinki for the launch of Destination Earth. Um, but Professor Doblos Reyes is the director of the Earth Sciences Department at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And uh, we look forward to hearing his talk about climate change in the Mediterranean region. Thank you. Good morning. I'd like to thank the organizers of the uh, last Countdown in Europe event to allow me to say a few words about uh, climate change and its impact on the, in the Mediterranean area, one of the areas in Europe that will suffer the most the uh, impacts of anthropogenic climate change. The European area, uh, the uh, sorry, the Mediterranean area, is uh, affected by climate change uh, in uh, several ways, mainly associated with the increases in temperature. It's also important to bear in mind that the uh, Mediterranean area is especially vulnerable, given uh, the uh, population that uh, is uh, uh, can be found in uh, its uh, neighborhoods in the uh, around the basin. 
which uh, has a very strong gradient in the uh, uh, adaptive uh, capacities uh, for the uh, impacts of climate change. Climate change is a problem that uh, goes well beyond the uh, scientific uh, interest and the scientific issues. One of the uh, uh, main difficulties that uh, can uh, 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 prevent uh, the uh, use of the uh, large amount of climate change impact information available currently in the uh, in society is the uh, are the barriers uh, for the uh, use of uh, these uh, environmental information that is freely available. The uh, limitations associated with those barriers come from the lack of awareness of the population, the difficulty of the interpretation of this information because it's not targeting specific uh, users of the information and also the lack of uh, expert synthesis that uh, brings together different uh, the expertise from different domains. The possible solution that we've been working on at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center is the development of environmental services that are co-developed between those that are uh, knowledgeable in the domain that uh, is sensitive to the impacts of climate change and those that are uh, able to handle and produce, uh, handle the different sources of climate data and uh, uh, produce climate information that is uh, sensitive uh, to the uh, uh, the uh, different um, uh, requirements formulated by those users. This is uh, developed in, in our department, in the Earth Sciences Department of the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, using a co-design and co-production approach that is implemented by a multidisciplinary team. Part of this team works on uh, uh, global climate modeling and the uh, uh, production of uh, climate data that uh, can be, uh, underpin the uh, generation of the climate information that can lead uh, to action. Uh, global climate modeling is an aspect uh, of science that requires uh, bringing together domain knowledge from uh, uh, the physical and uh, biochemical aspects of uh, climate uh, with uh, uh, the uh, capability of uh, coding and uh, modeling all these different aspects and uh, uh, so as to perform uh, experiments of climate uh, on supercomputers. So basically the idea is to perform experiments in silico instead of uh, keeping uh, performing experiments as we are doing right now with the real climate. Uh, global climate modeling takes into account, as I said before, different aspects of uh, that determine the uh, Earth's climate, like the evolution of the biochemistry, the climate mechanisms behind uh, physical climates, the role of the cryosphere, and also the analysis of many different aspects that are relevant uh, for the production of climate information, like, for instance, the understanding uh, and the uh, and, uh, projection of uh, the uh, climate extremes that are so relevant for society. Using those uh, uh, global climate models and uh, using additional tools like regional climate models and data analysis, we know that uh, there are uh, different scenarios and different uh, projections of uh, climate change for both the global climate and also for the different regions of the planet. And in this figure, we can see the projections of uh, uh, climate uh, for the Mediterranean for the 21st century, uh, considering different scenarios of socioeconomic development, um, and also using a range of uh, climate models uh, that have been produced in the last 10 years. These are the climate simulations that have been uh, uh, on the basis of the production of the IPCC sixth assessment report uh, by the uh, working group one, uh, wor working group uh, one, that is uh, the one that deals with the uh, physical aspects of climate change. It's interesting to bear in mind that this uh, uh, information, this data are publicly available and uh, the, the, it can't be used by a large range of uh, uh, sectors that are sensitive to uh, climate change. Uh, the problem, uh, as usual, is uh, that, that this, uh, it's not trivial to handle this uh, climate information, these sources of climate data that are varied and that uh, have different characteristics, even if they all look very similar. The uh, 
Uh, uh, this is another aspect that is handled at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, where we uh, 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 make sure that uh, those uh, that are working with uh, the uh, sensitive in uh, the uh, with uh, the users of the climate information in sensitive sectors like health. Uh, are working with experts on the handling and understanding of the climate data that are used to produ produce the climate information. One of the uh, things that we can see in this figure is the uh, uh, strong increase in, uh, in temperatures over the Mediterranean, in particular, these are results for summer. Um, uh, and even for uh, mitigation scenarios like the ones that appear in blue here, where we can see that by the end of the century, the increase of uh, temperature, summer temperatures in the uh, in the Mediterranean region, and this is on average over the whole region, is uh, going well beyond two degrees. And this is quite worrying because uh, one of the messages that we have uh, found and, uh, and concluded in the uh, uh, both in the uh, literature and recent publications, but also uh, coming out of the uh, uh, latest IPCC report, is that the uh, Mediterranean is warming faster than uh, the uh, uh, global climate. And uh, this is something that uh, we have assessed uh, using different climate experiments, the CIMIP-5 experiment that was performed around 10 years ago, and uh, the CIMIP-6 experiment also performed with uh, an international range of uh, climate models uh, that uh, was concluded a couple of years ago using uh, updated uh, climate models. And uh, basically the uh, conclusions are basically uh, are the same. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Mediterranean in particular in uh, spring, summer and autumn appears uh, to warm uh, much faster than the, uh, uh, than the, uh, the uh, uh, global mean climate. And that, that's one of the reasons why the Mediterranean is considered as uh, one of the uh, uh, hot spots of, uh, uh, of uh, 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 anthropogenic climate change. Uh, there are other regions in the planet, in particular in the high latitudes that are warming faster, but uh, this is particularly worrying, this, uh, this increase of uh, uh, the warming in the Mediterranean uh, because of its uh, sensitivity to the lack of uh, fresh water in the, in the region and the high pressures on uh, water systems in the, in the area. And uh, this is without saying that uh, the uh, uh, implications for, for instance, the uh, uh, impact of heat waves and high temperatures on health uh, is, uh, is also uh, going to increase in the future. Um, the uh, figure, the range of figures below uh, illustrates that the problem goes well beyond temperature increases. And uh, we can see that the Mediterranean is uh, for the range of latitudes where it's found between 30 degrees and 45 degrees north. The uh, uh, only region in that latitude, in a latitudinal band that uh, is showing a decrease in the uh, precipitation or a very strong decrease in the precipitation with respect to the rest of uh, its uh, uh, its uh, 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 of the similar regions uh, regions in the similar in similar latitudes and again the uh, uh, the largest impact is found in in uh, in uh, summer uh, although we also see that uh, the uh, the drying uh, appears uh, in winter so it's uh, basically throughout the year the uh, uh, so the one of the main messages is that there's conclusion of the Mediterranean warming uh, much faster than the uh, the rest of the, uh, or the average of the planet uh, can be concluded regardless of the scenario that we consider. And uh, this is what we can see in the uh, uh, bottom right figure that appears uh, in the, uh, the screen right now. So what, uh, if uh, we consider that the horizontal axis, we have the global mean temperature and in the vertical axis, we have the Mediterranean summer temperature, we can uh, uh, immediately see that uh, all the colored uh, figure lines appear above the diagonal, basically the, uh, uh, the dashed black line that appears uh, at the center of the figure. So regardless of the uh, uh, whether we consider the RCP scenarios uh, used in the CIMIP-5 experiments uh, from uh, uh, completed 10 years ago, or the SSP scenarios uh, completed uh, used in the CIMIP-6 experiment a few years ago, they all align very nicely uh, along the uh, the, uh, uh, the line that uh, follows uh, the uh, uh, the global mean temperature, but uh, with a higher slope. The, the slope meaning the increase in the slope, meaning that 
the uh, uh, global mean, uh, the the, the uh, summer temperature in the Mediterranean is uh, uh, going up uh, quicker than the global mean temperature. So when we refer to a planet that is uh, 1.5 or 2 degrees warmer than the pre-industrial climates, we are actually uh, referring in the Mediterranean context to much higher temperatures than this. Um, however, there are many other aspects of the uh, impact of uh, the of uh, climate change on the uh, uh, Mediterranean climate uh, that require a farther understanding uh, with respect to what we already have about uh, climate change in the region. And there are many different processes that are contributing to uh, uh, Mediterranean uh, warming like the ones that appear in this figure, this is only a summary of the many more that have to be taken into account. And uh, the, uh, uh, this is uh, to say that uh, the, the work is not done yet. So while there are very useful sources of uh, climate information that can be used to start informing the uh, so, uh, society and the se sector sensitive to climate change, there are many more questions that we still have to address to make that information more uh, uh, salient and uh, more credible and robust. And uh, this is where we trust we can con keep contributing to society at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Thanks very much. And uh, I wish you a very good and interesting event. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Uh, I now have the great pleasure to introduce Carmi Borre, the director of the Public Health Agency in Barcelona. Thank you so much. Good morning. Um, I would like to say thank you very much to have invited us. And I will speak on behalf of all the group of climate change in our institution. We have the responsibility for public health in the city of Barcelona. Here you have all the names. We have a group working in, in climate change in the institution and trying uh, to focus our institution in the different health aspects of, of climate change and public health. Um, several weeks ago, we published this conceptual framework. And um, for us, this is very important because uh, we have been working on it for one year. And Mar Marie and Laura Oliveras, they, are, they have led this, this paper. And it has been not, not easy to, 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 present, to, to work on it, but here you have it. We are very proud of this model. I don't know if you will like it. But here we present different aspects related with climate change. Um, we have the structural determinants. These are the, the main political factors uh, economic factors that are related with uh, uh, climate change. And then we have also different policies, access of inequalities, because we are uh, worried on inequalities in health and also inequalities in climate change. Then you have the intermediate determinants related with climate change, energy mobility, agri-food model, production and reproduction model, consumption of waste, etc. And then we have the consequence, the health consequence. And I will focus on this part because this part is more related with, with our uh, work as public health workers that, as we are. And at the end, you have health and health inequalities. Also, we have put health services, social services, climate justice, and policies related with climate change. And um, to start, uh, heat and health. What are we doing on heat and health? And uh, we have uh, shown in red color which part of the model are we talking now. The first one is uh, heat and what are we doing? We have several studies published on, uh, on the association between temperature and mortality and also focusing on inequalities in health. Mar Marie de Lolmo, is here, has led these papers and, and they show how mortality is associated with, uh, with uh, temperature. Also, we have a website. Uh, here you, you have the, um, the link of the website and uh, photography. 
showing the different indicators related with climate change for the neighborhoods and the city of Barcelona, and also showing the association between uh, temperature and mortality. In the different neighborhoods of the city, you can choose different indicators and you can choose different aspects. Uh, I invite you uh, to, to see the, the website. And at the end, to say that we are participating in, the, um, participating in the action plan to prevent health effects of heat wave, wave that is led by the Catalan uh, government. Second one, um, vector and uh, reservoir populations and transmissible disease also. What are we doing here? Um, Surveillance and control of disease transmitted by mosquitoes and other vectors. And for this, we have surveillance of the risk areas, attention to the complaints of the citizens, because they have the possibility to make a complaint through, through the website of the, of, of the local council, and also citizen science through the Mosquito Alert app. Uh, where you can uh, say if you have mosquitoes and, and we can intervene then. And also we have adaptive interventions as modification of mosquito breeding size of also educational workshops in the secondary schools. Well, another important aspect, food, uh, food availability and quality. We have also a group in our institution on food and different aspects. And this uh, working group is working on health in promotion, on protection, because we have the responsibility of uh, um, protection of, um, of food protection in the different uh, restaurants and, and different aspects of the, in the city, and also sustainable related to climate change food systems. We have outbreaks, control of outbreaks. We have a project in the schools that is very interesting, that is uh, changing the diet of the students in order that they eat less meat and they eat more proteins, vegetal proteins. We have now 41 schools. We had six last year as a pilot, and this year we have 41 schools, primary schools, and they are changing their diet. And we, we think that in the future we will have more. And also, uh, we are making surveillance of the health effects and also associate uh, inequalities. Uh, last, this week, three days ago, we had a, um, a workshop or a kind of congress, one day, talking about uh, food and climate change. It is very interesting. It is in our uh, website, the YouTube. You can see because there were many, many interesting presentations related with these aspects and also with the food systems and more, more systemic views of uh, food and health. And I think that it's necessary to have this systemic view to understand uh, all the aspects related with food, climate change and health. Water. Uh, what are we doing about water? Mm, then... Uh, many things, surveillance and control of drinking water quality, surveillance and control of the sanitary quality of the beaches, surveillance of the spread of Legionella that uh, can, can increase, the spread of Legionella with climate change, surveillance and control of uh, Legionella in other, uh, uh, other waterborne disease, and we have specific studies as, for example, effects of extreme uh, weather events on drinking water quality. And last one is uh, um, policies or interventions that we have. We have in Barcelona a program uh, directed to the uh, more the private neighborhoods. It's named Barcelona Salut als Barris. And we are trying to put climate change also in the programs in the, in the middle of the different interventions we are doing. We did a scoping review of effective community interventions to promote eco-social transition. We hope it will be published uh, in the near future. And uh, now we are um, uh, looking what can we implement in the different uh, neighborhoods related with um, community health, because it's our mission, community health. And, uh, and, and now we are designing a classroom specific in Poplasec to pilot if this classroom on climate change and health is useful or not. 
And also we are evaluate, evaluating different interventions. For example, um, a scholar refugees climatics, climate shelter schools. Uh, th this is a program of the of Barcelona, and we are also evaluating this program and other programs, as for example the superblocks, uh, superillas. And for coming, this will be this report on climate change and hell in the city. It is almost finished. We will publish it in the next weeks, and I think it will be very interesting for us. It has been very good to, to situate the situation for, uh, in our institution. And just to show you some projects for the future related with a monitoring system on climate change and health, uh, different indicators we are working on. I'm sure that the Lancet countdown will help us. Further research, further evaluation, continue to promote interventions, networking, and also organizational change in our institution, as for example, uh, we are now working on Plastic Zero in the institution and things like this that are very important also to advance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was uh, really fascinating to see from one end of the spectrum the climate science and all the models that go behind producing information to impact, understand the impacts of climate change on health and then seeing how climate change could be incorporated into supporting public health at the local level. So thank you so much, Carme. Uh, we're now going to start the next uh, part of the program, which is introducing the Lancet Countdown Collaboration and the Lancet Countdown Europe Report. So I'd like to welcome the Executive Director of the Lancet Countdown, Dr. Marina Romanello, to the stage, who's going to introduce to us uh, the Lancet Countdown Collaboration. Thank you, Marina. Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to be at the launch finally of the Europe Lancet Countdown. Um, you might have seen the presentation yesterday and I will apologize. There's just so much you can do with the same report over and over. But here we go. Um, you know this very well, but the Lancet Countdown is born actually in 2009 with the first ever Lancet Commission. The first ever Lancet Commission was on climate change and health. And that talks about the commitment of the Lancet to this cause, but also about the fundamental importance of climate change for our health. At this point, the information was quite scarce. So Richard Horton approached uh, Anthony Costello, who was mentioned before, the chair of the Lancet Countdown, and asked him to evaluate, to put a team together, an interdisciplinary team, to look at what was this deal between climate change and health. And this commission, when it was launched, was received with a bit of disbelief because of a very shocking finding that climate change is the biggest global health threat of the 21st century. At that point, people did not quite believe that that could be so. But the health community got on board and the Lancet was an enormous voice for credibility. And just six years later, the science had moved enough that we had the second Lancet Commission. And this second Lancet Commission was quite interesting because it not only reiterated and confirmed that this is actually the biggest uh, threat to our existence for this century, but actually that all of those activities that we could do in terms of tackling climate change are actually very sensible public health interventions that the health community has been calling for for years. So the headline of this commission is slightly different. Tackling climate change is the biggest global health opportunity of the 21st century, and we need the whole health community on board to make sure that that is true. One of the recommendations here was that we actually need to start monitoring the extent to which when we tackle the climate crisis, we actually do deliver on health. And if you look at the year of the second report, you might recognize it's the same year that the Paris Agreement was signed. The Paris Agreement was set to tackle climate change. It was a groundbreaking agreement where countries finally got together to say they would do something about it. And they also committed to doing a global stock take to make sure that we can track progress and we can keep countries accountable. The global stock take is going to be refined now. Um, in this year's is when the global stock take is going to take shape and we're going to see what we're going to define progress against. 
And it's crucially important that when we track progress against tackling climate change, we monitor progress against making it not the biggest global health threat, but the biggest global health opportunity. So it is with that that the Lancet Countdown was born. Again, enormous support from the Lancet, which tells you just how important this issue is for health. And we were set to publishing indicator reports, which we've been doing for seven years, seven iterations of over 40 indicators that monitor the health impacts of climate change, what some spheres of, of climate change call loss and damage, but also the opportunities that could arise and are arising of the transition. So we're monitoring financial transition, the extent to which we're actually compensating or not, to which the economics and the finances are changing towards a healthy future, the extent to which the health co-benefits are being realized, that enormous global health opportunity that could give us today instant benefits to health. So we've just published the seventh indicator report, and that was published alongside other regional reports, uh, thanks to the help of the Lancet Public Health, that I don't know how they still like us. It is quite remarkable. But obviously, when we look at the global scene, the global scene is very interesting. It helps assess global progress, and climate change is a global crisis. But we've heard just now just how important it is to have local data. Decision makers need to know what's happening on the ground for their people. And for that reason, we started opening throughout the last three years centers around the world. The Lancet Countdown in Europe that is being launching the, their first report today, well, actually this week, it seems like a lifetime ago already, three days ago, um, it was actually born uh, some three years ago. We started thinking about this collaboration, putting people together, and just we knew that Europe is obviously fundamentally important for climate change and health. But the real wind in the sail of Europe came from the European Commission because they reached out to us and they told us that they desperately needed indicators to monitor what's happening with climate change and health in the region. And that is where things completely changed for us. That happened about two and a half years ago now, I think, or two years ago. Um, and they were actually demanding us to produce the data that they need with the enormous amount of data and information that you have for Europe. Europe is a region with enormous data capacity that doesn't happen in other regions of the world. So um, we started pulling strings and trying to build this collaboration together. Rachel was crazy enough to say yes, I will never understand why. And we have the Barcelona Supercomputing Center behind it. Catherine and IS Global also came on board and made this absolutely fantastic collaboration. And I cannot think of two institutes that are better equipped to tackling this problem. And being here in Barcelona, to me, my last name is Gerald, for those of you that are Catalanes. I don't speak Catalan. But being here in Barcelona is absolutely fantastic. The community that has been built around the Lancet Countdown in Europe is putting so much effort, and the links that they have directly to government, to the European Commu uh, Commission, explain just how important it is that we do start tracking this and keep countries, local governments, and companies accountable. Bringing together all of these people, We've outdone ourselves slightly. We have about 100 collaborating institutions around the world. You won't see every one of them there because it would just be too packed, but you will recognize a few big faces. We have leading UN institutions. We have leading international academic organizations. And all together, the community that contributes, most of them voluntarily to the Lancet Countdown, are about 300 leading scientists of all around the world. And I want to stress voluntarily because this is made out of a firm belief that there's no other more important challenge than tackling climate change and that science needs to be at the service of humanity at this point in time. There you go. Um, so, as I said, we've launched the global report on Tuesday evening alongside the regional reports in Europe and the Australian report. The Australian has been producing five reports already, which is quite interesting, and Europe produced its first report, which was an enormous amount of work for the whole collaboration. We're gonna have the China report also published on Saturday night, and very soon we're gonna have the first South American report, which is quite interesting, because it's the first actual regional report that does not rely on local data infrastructure. So it's gonna try to promote that local data generation. So that is coming uh, in the next couple of months. 
And just to give you a bit of an overview, I'm sure you're sick of hearing me talk about this already, but um, just to give you a bit of an overview of what the indicator reports this year show, because I think it's very important that we all realize just how big the global challenge is. We're seeing today a persistent fossil fuel addiction, and I don't take the word addiction lightly, but we're seeing that when we're in the midst of a crisis of energy, of a cost of living crisis and of a climate crisis, we're still refusing to shift away from fossil fuels. We're seeing that climate change is intensifying extreme weather events and the associated impacts all around the world. We've seen this year the floods in Pakistan were devastating. Europe had record droughts, and I think many of us experienced that firsthand. It was really unusual to see London with 40 degrees. We're seeing South America, Argentina, where I'm from, we have a river with record low levels of water that has stalled commerce in the area with enormous impacts to the local communities that depend on that river flow. We're seeing the climate change impacts of health exacerbating all around the world. And what is perhaps more important is that today, when we're in a cost of living crisis, an energy crisis, a food crisis, climate change is starting to undermine the foundations that we need to build the resilience to cope with those other hazards. So we're seeing that with the war in Ukraine, crop supplies are being put at risk. We're seeing that with COVID, food insecurity increased drastically around the world. And climate change now is starting to undermine our food productivity, labor capacity in the agricultural sector, um, the supply chains that we depend on, and putting food security at risk for millions around the world. For the first time, we've quantified food insecurity linked to heat waves this year. And I think that is one of the most concerning findings. But beyond the exacerbation of climate change impacts, the fossil fuel addiction is also leading to direct impacts, and we heard a bit about air pollution already. Energy poverty is still an enormous problem, not only in places where we traditionally think about when we think about food, uh, energy insecurity that are poor neighborhoods. In the UK where I'm from, people are not being able to afford the energy they need to keep their, their, their homes at a reasonable healthy temperature this winter. And what's happening is that because we're so overly dependent on fossil fuels and we refuse to make the transitions when we could have because we do have the technology, we're still 100% dependent on fossil fuel markets that are volatile and subject to geopolitical problems. So today, we're seeing rising energy prices and people struggling to heat their home, going back to dirty fuels and an acute threat of indoor air pollution as a result of this compounding crisis. And we have a bit of an idea of why that is. Um, we've quantified the extent to which governments are still financing the fossil fuel industry and fossil fuel consumption. We looked at, I think, 86 countries around the world that contribute to about 90% of all global greenhouse gas emissions, and 80% of them were still actively subsidizing fossil fuel uh, burning. The volume of those subsidies pulled together was $400 billion in 2019 alone. You can imagine that with the rising energy prices, that increased pretty significantly this year. So we're still allocating hundreds of billions to promoting fossil fuel burning, despite all the harms to our health, but we're not being able to put together 100 billion a year to support a just transition. So that tells you a bit where our priorities are. And perhaps what is more concerning is that while countries are subsidizing fossil fuels, the level of subsidies they allocate is sometimes comparable to the total health budgets. That is insane. We're paying polluters to pollute and to harm our health when we have the technology and we know where we need to put the funds to promote a healthy transition. We looked at companies and we saw that the 15 giants that we assess, both national and international companies, are nowhere near the greenwash that we see in their web pages. If they take the strategies now forward, the assets that they have now, the investment plans they're doing today forward, by 2040 they will have more than doubled the level of emissions compatible with the Paris Agreement goals. They will lock us into a future of exacerbated health impacts and that just cannot happen. <coughs> we're subsidizing them, mind you. So now that I've depressed you all, it's not all bad news. Because countries are now striving to develop responses to the compounding crisis, they're rethinking their energy strategies. We've seen a lot of conversations lately about what we're gonna do about energy this winter. Many countries are going back to fossil fuels. That is putting a small band-aid to a bleeding. 
if now we go back to fossil fuels in the long term, with long term investments, that is what they're doing, they're not just trying to produce energy now, they're doing long term investments, a healthy future just won't be possible. However, today, because they need to respond to the energy crisis, we did see here in Europe many countries saying, well, we need to actually redouble ambitions towards clean energy production. And you think, what were you waiting? But fair enough, they're now having a new incentive to redouble the low carbon energy generation and the investments in the low carbon energy sector. And by doing that, they can not only enable um, improved energy access, they can also reduce reliance on volatile fossil fuel markets and all the ge geopolitical problems that they come along with. They can deliver cleaner air immediately. They can promote healthier cities with more active travel, greener cities with improved mental and physical health outcomes. They can improve today a transition towards low carbon diets. We've heard already just how much that could help our health. We estimate about 11.5 million deaths every year could be avoided if we were to transition to healthier, fairer diets, alongside enormous savings in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And 1.2 million deaths saved from outdoor air pollution alone that comes directly from the burning of fossil fuels. So today as countries try to devise these responses, it's so important that as we head up to COP27, we stress the need to really invest in a low carbon transition, because anything else would be a death sentence, not only in low middle income countries, also here in Europe. And just to close, um, Antonio Guterres has been enormously engaging with us. And that is not because he's doing us a favor, that is because he saw our reports and he's realizing just how great the situation is. So I'm just gonna leave that up there for you a moment. I'm not gonna read it because I'm not gonna embarrass myself. But just for you to get a bit of awareness of the extent of the challenge. This is at the highest levels of the UN now, trying to tackle this, um, the problem of climate change and health. And this is just how important it is that we have local data produced for Europe to inform these decisions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marina. Um, we're delighted to have joined uh, the Lancet Countdown Collaboration, and thank you for setting the scene. Just wait for the slides. Wait for the slides. Okay. So now um, we have the opportunity to present to you our first uh, report, the 2020, um, 2022 report of the Lancet Countdown in Europe towards a climate resilient future. And just before that, I just want to say a few words about our collaboration. We launched um, a year ago um, and our mission as an area of the globe um, historically and currently contributing more to greenhouse gas emissions and also been an important financer of adaptation and mitigation measures, it's our responsibility to act and raise awareness of this issue to protect the health both of uh, people living in Europe and um, the health of those across the planet. So we're delighted to be one of the newest um, Lancet Countdown centers in the Lancet Countdown family. And our uh, collaboration, we adopt the same approach as the Lancet Countdown which is to monitor uh, the impacts of health on climate change across five different domains. So we look at the impacts of um, climate change on health in terms of hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. We look at the way that systems are adapting to climate change and also efforts to mitigate the problem and what are the co-benefits of those mitigation measures. We also look at the economic and um, financial uh, dimension of the problem in the transition towards a clean, more healthy economy and look at the political and social engagement in framing climate change as a public health problem. So this is our Lancet Countdown team. Um, I'm the director and I'm very happy to be joined recently by Catherine Tony as co-director of the collaboration. We have our chairs, um, Maria Nelson from Umia University and Josette Marie Anton from IS Global. Um, Kim Van Dallen, she has been uh, leading the collaboration uh, and has done an absolutely fantastic job of bringing us all together. And I'm delighted that she will be joining us in Barcelona from January to start a postdoctoral position at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. 
Um, we have um, some e brilliant experts across Europe um, leading the different work packages, and we have our WHO uh, Europe observers, as well as Marina, um, the executive director of the um, Lancet Glo um, the global team. And this collaboration would not have been possible without the 44 authors who have contributed to the report, some of which are in the room. Put your hand up if you're an author of the Lancet Countdown in Europe. Yay, thank you. <laughs> it's been absolutely amazing to work with you all. Um, and please reach out to the authors if you have more questions. And these uh, experts are based across 29 institutes in Europe. We have a page on the Lancet Countdown website where you can learn more about our Europe collaboration. We also have our own Twitter account, so please do follow us on Twitter for the latest updates about our reports and the work across our collaboration. And our output so far, we published our first um, framework report uh, laying out our vis vision for this collaboration in the Lancet Public Health uh, last September. And then we're very delighted and so grateful to Audrey, the Editor-in-Chief of the uh, Lancet Public Health, for giving us the opportunity to publish our first indicator report, um, which came out at the same time as a global report on uh, the 25th of October. Um, we um, have an important role to contribute policy relevant indicators to stakeholders across Europe. We're particularly working with the European Climate and Health Observatory, which is a collaboration between the EU, the European Environment Agency, and many other partners. Uh, the Lancet Countdown is an important uh, contributor to this. Uh, the platform provides a series of country profiles, case studies, forecasts, and indicators and we are particularly contributing uh, 10 of our Lancet Countdown Europe indicators. Here we have examples of um, exposure to green space and climate sensitive infectious diseases. And on the 9th of uh, November, uh, the EEA will be launching these indicators and users will be able to access them and look at the indicator specific for their particular region or country. We've also been working to contribute to policy reports. In particular, this year, um, we've contributed heat and infectious disease indicators to this report, um, which will be also launched on the 9th of November. So you can follow the launch event that will be um, operated by the, the EEA. So now we're going to present um, some of the findings from our report. So the first section looks at climate change impacts, exposure, and vulnerabilities. And we focus on particular areas, particularly heat and health, extreme events and health, climate sensitive infectious diseases, and allergens. So I'm just going to pick out a couple of the findings. So one of them is from um, IS Global team. I hope that I think the authors are here in the room. So this indicator is tracking um, changes in risky hours um, attributable to doing uh, physical activity in heat, uh, in extreme heat. And we can see that there has been an increase in the number of risky hours, particularly for strenuous activity, um, with an additional 627 hours um, in 2020. So um, this is very important. And as Paco Doblas Reyes uh, mentioned, the Mediterranean area is particularly a climate change hotspot in terms of uh, temperature and the coastal areas of Spain and the rest of the Mediterranean uh, basin are particularly at risk from extreme heat related to physical activity. We also have an indicator looking at the uh, changing trends in heat-related mortality. Um, we can see uh, an increase over a 20-year period. For the whole of Europe, we're seeing an additional um, 15 um, annual deaths per million inhabitants per decade. And we can see that in Spain, um, the trend is uh, almost double that, um, up to 30 additional deaths. And when we look at this, for the elderly population, those 65 and elder, um, this increase is substantially higher. We also have an indicator looking at the impacts of drought across Europe. So this is looking at um, extreme to exceptional droughts, uh, tracking the standardized precipitation and evapotranspiration indicator. And we see that for around half of the um, areas in Europe, they've experienced these extreme droughts, and about a third of those, uh, the majority of these extreme droughts over a 70-year period have happened in just the last 10 years. 
We also have indicators tracking uh, changes in climatic suitability for particularly mosquito-borne diseases. This is a new indicator to the Lancet Countdown Collaboration, looking at changes in the risk um, for West Nile virus using climatic indicators. And if we focus in on um, Southern Europe, um, we can see an increase of 150% um, in uh, the risk of West Nile virus. We also see an increasing pattern for the reproduction number and the length of the transmission season for dengue, um, with an overall increase across Europe of 17%. And we also superimposed a sub-indicator looking at um, the risk of importation of dengue by looking at um, movement patterns from areas where dengue is endemic to those areas in Europe that are climatically suitable for dengue. And this, in, this has increased by 600% um, over the last uh, 30 years. Uh, lastly, in our um, impacts uh, indicators, we have a new indicator tracking changes in the length of the clinically relevant pollen season. Um, so we've been uh, using uh, temperature information atmospheric model to understand how the season for um, these uh, uh, pollen, particularly looking at alder, birch, and olive, how this is changing. And here we can see um, the difference for both birch and olive. And if we look in Spain, we can particularly see a shift of around 10 to 20 days in the start of the season. And this has really important implications for those who um, have uh, suffer from allergy uh, related to pollen. Now going to briefly mention some of the indicators we have tracking uh, adaptation. Uh, this, uh, this finding, looking at climate information used for health, is based on a survey conducted by the WHO European region where they looked at 22 countries and found that 36% of those uh, countries that were um, surveyed um, have um, some sort of climate-informed uh, health system for tracking um, injury uh, mortali and mortality related to extreme climatic events. 27% are using climate information to understand vector-borne diseases and 18% uh, for waterborne diseases. Spain was not one of the survey countries, but I very, look, I very much look forward to in the panel discussion understanding how um, decision makers in Barcelona, Catalonia and Spain are using climate information for their decisions related to health. And finally, we have an indicator uh, tracking um, the population exposure to green space. We can see in south of Europe, there's been an increase over the last uh, 20 years in um, areas um, with green space. This is based on a population-weighted uh, normalized difference vegetation index uh, with a less of an increase um, in northern Europe. And if we look at uh, city level tree cover, uh, we see um, some cities in Italy with the highest amount of tree cover. And unfortunately, London has uh, one of the lowest uh, levels of, of tree cover across Europe. And I'm now going to pass over to my colleague, Catherine Tone, who is leading on um, the Working Group on Mitigation Actions and Health Co-Benefits and is also the co-director of the Lancet Countdown Europe. So thank you, Catherine. But to carry on from uh, where Rachel left off, I'll give an overview of some of the indicators that we report in this uh, first indicator report, tracking mitigation action in Europe and the associated health co-benefits. So here you can see an overview of all of the indicators that we've developed for this first report. I'll just highlight a few um, key ones. Uh, this is an indicator tracking the carbon intensity of the energy system. Uh, what you can see here is that historically, uh, between this period 1990 and 2020, uh, the carbon intensity of the energy system has been going down, those black dots, but uh, we're nowhere close in terms of the rate of change for where we need to be to reach reach net zero in 2050. So essentially we would need to uh, in increase the pace of, of decarbonization by about fivefold, uh, as represented by that red line there, to reach net zero by 2050. 
uh, we have an indicator tracking coal phase out in Europe. Uh, it is going down. So since 1991, coal use has dropped in Europe by around 56%. However, it still remains a substantial fuel in the European energy mix at about 12%. This was based on 2020. Obviously, now in 2022, we're seeing uh, sort of some backsliding uh, that is going to keep coal in the energy system uh, for several years to come based on the, the current energy crisis that we face. Um, so there is uh, a particular good news story, I think, here when you look at uh, the coal phase out in terms of Spain. So on that, uh, uh, the uh, share of coal used in the, elect in the electricity supply, you can see that the uh, coal phase out has been quite uh, effective in Spain. Um, and uh, you know, this is what we need to see for many other countries, uh, particularly in, uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, this an indicator tracks renewable and zero carbon emissions. Uh, what we can see from this indicator is that um, the share of zero carbon energy in the total energy supply is relatively low for many, uh, for, for uh, Europe overall, it's about 21%. And we have about 17% of electricity that's generated from renewables. So this is increasing uh, quite dramatically in the last few years, but overall still remains quite a small percentage percentage of, uh, of you know, the source of electricity in Europe. Um, we have an indicator tracking premature mortality attributable to ambient air pollution or uh, fine particles in particular. This is a leading environmental risk factor for premature mortality uh, in Europe. Air pollution levels have been going down over the last few decades, which is uh, great news, but we still have about 120 uh, deaths, uh, premature deaths that are completely avoidable, that are due to the combustion of fossil fuels. And much of the progress that we've seen in the last few decades have been really through improved emissions efficiency and emissions control technology, so end of pipe measures. But uh, what we really need to see is measures that deliver the win-wins in terms of reductions in greenhouse gas and uh, uh, reductions in air pollution emissions, essentially trans, uh, transitioning to renewables. So you can see for Southern Europe, really the main source of fossil fuels that is contributing the most to the health burden related to air pollution is liquid fuels in the transport sector. Um, this indicator is tracking life cycle emissions from food demand. So you can see the comparison of uh, total greenhouse uh, gas emissions uh, in, 20, um, in, in 2010 and 2019, and the proportion that is coming from food demand. So in Europe overall, about 31% of the total greenhouse gas emissions is coming from, uh, from food demand. So there's really quite considerable potential for decarbonization by focusing on on food systems. And uh, when you look at where those emissions are coming from, really it's driven uh, predominantly by uh, consumption of red meat and uh, dairy. So this uh, now uh, gets into the indicators that are tracking uh, progress or, or, or uh, related to the economics and finance around uh, 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 climate change and health. We have an indicator in our report looking at the economic losses due to climate-related uh, extreme events. Um, obviously, climate-related extreme events can damage physical infrastructure, undermine public service provision, and uh, affect health in direct and indirect ways. And over the past decade, uh, the highest economic losses due to climate-related uh, extreme events have happened in, in 2021. So you can see that very clearly in this, in this graph. And the majority of this came from the uh, quite severe flooding uh, that occurred in Germany in 2021. This is an indicator looking at the change in labor supply due to uh, extreme heat, uh, which can uh, not only affect the health of workers, but also reduce labor supply and productivity. Uh, and what uh, this is uh, showing is the reduction in uh, days of, uh, of, of, of productive labor per worker per person and you see or per year. Uh, and you can see quite a lot of uh, spatial heterogeneity in the impacts 
here uh, with the area around the Mediterranean and particularly impacted by loss of worker productivity. This is just showing that in a bit more um, uh, resolution, spatial resolution. You can see particularly uh, uh, in higher losses in worker uh, productivity in the coastal regions. Um, Marina t uh, talked about uh, you know, the implications of our fossil fuel addiction. Europe uh, is, is uh, not uh, so immune in any way from this. You know, what we find is still over half of the countries reviewed in our report have uh, net negative carbon prices, so essentially are continue to, fo uh, to subsidize fossil fuels. Uh, we have a set of indicators that are tracking engagement with uh, climate change and health. Uh, these indicators are tracking engagement in, in the scientific community, in the general public, as well as among politicians and uh, the private sector. So I'll just highlight uh, a few here. This is the indicator really uh, focusing on engagement at this intersection between health and climate change in the scientific community. Uh, what this indicator shows is that uh, there are, again, continues to be more and more attention and papers generated uh, on this uh, intersection between the topics. Of the areas that have been um, the, the focus of research, uh, Spain is among one of the, the top areas, which you can see in the map. And um, while most of the research that's been done on climate change and health has focused on the impacts on health, uh, what you can see is that over time, uh, a greater uh, share is, uh, is devoted to looking at the opportunities. So really, how can we promote health through climate change adaptation and mitigation, which you can see in the sort of red and yellow uh, contribution to those bars. So this slide gives a sort of overall picture of uh, bringing together many of our indicators in the report. That top panel is focusing on climate change related uh, health indicators. So the larger the, the value, essentially the bigger the impact. Um, on the bottom, we have uh, indicators that are, are tracking progress. So really, uh, how, are, uh, how are we responding to climate change? And here, the bigger the uh, value, the stronger the response. So unfortunately, you can see quite a lot of this light blue color in our response, indicating that you know, there's really a, a lack of ambition in terms of our response to climate change in the European region. Uh, I just wanted to mention uh, that the European Commission has uh, recently invested 60 million euro in the area of climate change and health uh, by funding a, a set of projects. So there are six projects funded under uh, this call that's mentioned here. Uh, the projects are working together as a cluster, uh, trying to identify uh, synergies in areas related to data management, uh, a sort of uh, joined up policy strategy, uh, as well as to develop uh, um, uh, communications and dissemination strategy at the cluster level to really uh, um, it, it, it give us a louder voice as at, uh, beyond the individual projects. There are two particular projects that have been uh, basically cooperating very closely with the Lancet Countdown for Europe, uh, the Catalyze Project uh, and the ID Alert Project. Uh, I will say a few words about the Catalyze project, which I coordinate from IS Global. Um, the Catalyze project really uh, ties most closely to the areas in the Lancet Countdown Europe that focus on mitigation, adaptation, as well as the in engagement, the policy engagement. Um, and Catalyze really tries to uh, address three, uh, three specific questions. How do we optimize health in climate change mitigation and adaptation policy in Europe? So we're looking very closely at uh, you know, real uh, poli uh, policies that are being considered at the European level. Um, uh, and we're also looking at how to close the knowledge to action gap, uh, basically in the policy level, but also looking at individual behavior change to really see how do we, we, we have a lot of evidence, that evidence isn't getting through the policy process or to individuals, you know, what can we do about that to really accelerate uh, climate change action? And thirdly, we have a strong focus on health professionals and health systems, and we'll be investigating you know, how health systems can adapt most effectively to climate change and reduce the quite considerable uh, carbon footprint of health systems in, in Europe. And, uh, I think Rachel will say a few words about ID Alert. 
Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, so we're delighted that both Catalyze and Idealer are um, supporting the activities of the Atlantic Countdown in Europe. Um, I'm co-coordinating uh, the Idealer project with um, Umia University. And at this project, uh, we hope to develop new decision support tools to uh, resist emerging health threats in Europe and beyond. Um, we're particularly uh, looking at trying to integrate the IPCC framing of risk in terms of hazard exposure and vulnerability with the One Health approach to surveillance, looking at animal, human and environmental health all together to develop some rust, uh, robust decision support tools. Uh, we're working with many partners, including those in the room. We have, uh, for example, John Palmer from the um, UPF is here, who's uh, co-director of the Mosquito Alert Project, which is an important citizen science project that is part of this, as well as Thomas Montalvo and colleagues at the Agencia de Salud Pública de Barcelona. And we're working um, to develop tools, um, both at a regional level across Europe, We'll be developing indicators in the framework of the Lancet Countdown in Europe, so tracking uh, changes and impacts and uh, responses um, uh, annually and across space. And we'll also be looking at developing sub-seasonal to seasonal uh, forecasts of uh, the changes in climate suitability for certain zoonotic infectious diseases, as well as projecting those risks into the future based on different scenarios of adaptation and mitigation efforts. We're also working in particular hotspots, so in Barcelona and in Girona, as well as it with partners in Greece, in the Netherlands, in Sweden and in Bangladesh, to develop uh, integrated early warning systems combining both climate information with uh, novel data sets to try and increase um, the way that we can rapidly respond and protect local populations to these uh, emerging health risks. So with that, I would just like to finish our presentation with a few key messages from our report. So number one, we're seeing the evidence shows that we have accelerating trends in health-related hazards, exposures, vulnerabilities, and risks from climate change. We're seeing a lack of su sufficiently ambitious adaptation and mitigation strategies in Europe and the implementation of ambitious mitigation and adaptation strategies will not only protect the lives and, and well-being in Europe, but also to the populations that have historically contributed least to anthropogenic climate change. So I'd like to thank you, and before we close, I would just like to call a special thank, out, uh, thank you to the teams who have supported this event, particularly the IS Global team. We're incredibly grateful to Sarah Williams, to Esther Brinkis, to Maria Carmen um, Garcia, and to Pau Ruby um, for supporting this event. And at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, I'm incredibly grateful to Jose Canovas, to Martin Lotto, and to Chloe Fetcher, who have been supporting um, both the comms, the dissemination, and the organization of the event. So thank you so much, and thank you to all of you for coming. Really appreciate it. And just um, uh, very briefly, I would like to welcome Audrey Chechia. And just if you'd like to just um, say a couple of words and um, welcome any questions. Okay, we have, uh, we're really delighted to have a fantastic lineup. So I invite uh, our, our panelists. We have Carme Boré, the director of the Public Health Agency of, of Barcelona, Carme Cabezas, the secretary of public health from the Generalitat, um, Salvador Samitieg, I come and uh, invite you to come and uh, sit on the stage here. Uh, Ana Romero, the head of climate emergency and environmental education service from the metropolitan area of, Barcel of Barcelona. 
Jose Maria Anto, uh, who is the co-chair of the Atlantic Countdown for Europe. Uh, he's a senior research professor and former scientific director of the, uh, at IS Global. And we have Anil Markandia. Uh, he is the, uh, the Ikea Basque professor at the Basque Center for Climate Change and leads our, our Atlantic Countdown Europe working group focused on economics and finance. So thank you very much for uh, joining us. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure to get this sort of diversity of perspectives that this uh, panel uh, has, uh, has to offer. So I'll be directing uh, one or two questions to each of you individually, and uh, um, I'll start with a first question uh, directed to, um, to uh, Carmen Cabezas. What is, in your view, are the most important public health challenges regarding climate change mitigation and adaptation for Catalonia? And also, if, if Carmen Borrell, you could address the same question, uh, focusing in more on uh, Barcelona. So, uh, please, Carmen. Thank you to the organizers and also thank you to the researchers and, uh, and all the team that is involved in the Lancet Countdown Europe uh, for this in interesting, very interesting report and uh, for all this information about the, the main pri priorities for uh, this uh, field of action and public health. Um, okay, from our point of view of public health and looking for the indicators, especially related with health, uh, we are seeing here in our country uh, that, uh, for instance, uh, arboviruses are taking hold and, and are increasing. And, uh, for instance, we have now some cases of West Nile, autochthonous West Nile, and also we have these uh, important in number of cases of dinghy and also of, uh, of uh, other fika, chikungunya, so on. And um, regarding this point of view, it's very important to continue to work in the actions uh, that we are doing and also with the municipalities in order to control the vectors, the mosquitoes, and so on, and also to work in this One Health vision. And also we have, uh, as you have said before, this aspect of the, the deaths and the health uh, results regarding to the uh, excess of the temperature. And we have uh, been seen for this summer, this uh, long row of uh, days and nights with uh, high temperatures. And that is, uh, has um, uh, has uh, been a result in an excess of deaths that are very, very um, worrying for us. Uh, for that reason, it's very important uh, to work in the mit mitigation strategies and also in the adaptation strategies with more spaces for climate shelter and, um, and also working with the more vulnerable uh, populations, for instance, elderly people and people with chronic diseases in order to avoid these uh, effects. And also it's very important this effort in, uh, in regarding to the inequalities and uh, to the people that is in uh, low socioeconomic uh, levels. Also, it's very important the air quality and the air pollution, as you said before. And I think that we have an uh, episode of uh, particle threshold being exceeded. And this is uh, very important, all the, the things and all the actions that are related to, to decrease the use of fossil um, uh, fossil, uh, I don't, uh, fossil, um, Fuels. Okay, yes, perfect. And also we are very worried about the water because, as you said before, we have this episode of droughts and that is very important in our country. And we are working uh, in the reuse of water and uh, for, uh, for, many, for many uses. And also it's very important uh, to take measures to monitor and um, to control drinking water uh, 
because we have this problem, especially in some rural areas of our country. Uh, and also there are some problems with food safety. As you know, extreme vigilance is required against marine biotoxins and food surveillance. And uh, that is regarding to the, that is important for the adaptation and for the messages to the, to the population and to, to put in practice some, some, this, uh, some of these measures in order to avoid the, the health effects of this, uh, this very uh, worrying situation. And also we work in the interdepartment mental commission with the other departments in order to apply uh, measures of mitigation and, and also we try to apply that in our uh, department of health in order to, to renew the, the energy issues in our buildings and also to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and the conversion of the vehicle fleet and so on. And I think we have many, many things to do and I think that the situation is very worrying and I have, um, for me, is one of the main, main priorities for, for our public health system. Thank you. And for Barcelona? Um, I will be brief because I have spoken, <laughs> spoken before. Just to following to work with the local council of Barcelona in the, in the climate change plan of the local council and trying to advance in the monitoring system using the Lancet countdown, as Tony has said, I, I, I will say, because I think that this will help us to advance. And three aspects, environment, temperature, air, water vector, as I have explained, food, food, Food systems are 30%, if I, I, I know well about climate change responsibility, then food, very important. And three, community interventions. Following to do community interventions in our neighborhoods in order to advance also in, in, in this issue. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we would love to hear from you how we can make the Lancet Countdown uh, monitoring mechanism more useful for, you know, on the ground in, the, in, in local uh, scale. Um, my next question is for, oh, it's all of a sudden very loud. Uh, um, in, in many respects, health is still not at the center of, of the response to climate change. Uh, so my question is, you know, would you agree with that? And really, what could be done to uh, integrate health considerations more fully into the response to climate change in, in Catalonia and beyond? Uh, so Sal Salvador, could you, I would love to hear your response to that question. Uh, thank you very much, and um, all the organizers. And um, sign, uh, from our experience, I uh, have to say that perhaps health with uh, water management has been in Catalonia the sectors that historically uh, have taken uh, more seriously and uh, the climate uh, change and the challenge that it uh, represents. Uh, we uh, saw it uh, when we approved the first uh, adaptation strategy for Catalonia in 2012. And we have seen it again in, uh, very recently because we have finished the technical work for the new adaptation strategy for the Horizon uh, 2030. So um, uh, the, the, these strategies are the general framework but uh, they have to be uh, developed by the sectoral planning. Uh, this, is, uh, this now is compulsory. Since uh, uh, 2017 is a, is a mandate to all uh, government uh, departments because in this year we approve uh, also the, the Catalan law on climate change. It uh, was one of the first regional uh, climate change law. And uh, now uh, in Catalonia is uh, all the governments when they uh, approve uh, a sectoral plan, uh, they have to include the uh, climate change uh, view uh, inside. In the in in the health sector, obviously, is uh, they are they have also this mandate. But perhaps it has been easiest because what I have said because they began 
with uh, a relationship between health and climate change earlier than other uh, sectors uh, in, in Catalonia. For example, since uh, 2004, uh, we have the action plan to prevent the effects of heat waves on, on health. No? There is more than uh, 16 years with uh, these uh, action plans for one of the most important impacts here in the, in the Mediterranean sector that are uh, heat waves. No? And uh, for example, in the new uh, 2021 uh, to 2024 health plan, uh, we ha the, they have changed uh, some words. We are not talking about climate change. We are talking about climate emergency. This is a significant significant uh, change. And uh, climate emergency is considered one of the fundamental health determinants that must be taken into account of health actions. No? And some of the elements that are in, are in this plan are uh, reducing inequalities, emphasizing the most vulnerable groups, avoiding exposure to biological, physical, or environmental factors, strengthening public health services, or integration the social care and health. And all these elements, uh, all these measures are clearly linked with uh, the vulnerability reduction and are important also from the climate change adaptation uh, view. So I think that in, in, in Catalonia, the inside the health sector, the perspective and the idea of climate change is a very important issue. I think it's totally introduced. I have to say that I will be happy if all the other sectors, uh, economical sectors and all the other sectors have uh, had this clear uh, idea as the health uh, department uh, have at this, at this moment. And not is because uh, they are here, <laughs> but uh, it, it, it's true. It's the same with uh, water management, perhaps because we are in the Mediterranean and water always has been a very scarce uh, issue, so are uh, the first that uh, move uh, of, of this new uh, uh, idea. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Anna, uh, would love to hear your, your perspective from the Area Metropolitana de Barcelona. Okay, uh, thank you to the Lancet Countdown and all the organizers for being here. I'll just uh, take a minute to explain that Area Metropolitana is a public administration responsible for uh, the services for 3.2 million people, Barcelona and 35 more municipalities for uh, waste treatment, uh, sewage water, mobility. And this, this means that we are fighting every day climate change and, and looking after health indirectly. So um, we are the ones that are asked for action in water uh, cycle and we have a, a great experience then. But uh, we also need uh, studies and we also <coughs> need to learn how these uh, more than three million people uh, get affected in, uh, in their health. So I just will give an example that I think it's very linked to the, the information we saw today, to the indicators of the Lancet countdown. This last year we studied for the first time the, uh, the social vulnerability to climate change in this area. And we did this with the uh, Institute uh, Regional for Metropolitan Studies of Barcelona, Barcelona with the ERM. And we work in an index. This index is trying to deconstruct all the factors that, um, that uh, provokes, that, that make that uh, some of these 3.2 million people are more vulnerable, that increase inequity and inequality with this population. For example, I, I will only uh, like make some, some slides or some, some uh, synthesis, but we know that uh, there are components that increase this risk. For example, high density areas, lacking green spaces, and also lacking access to renewals. This is one component that uh, accounts for 20% of this vulnerability. Another one, for example, uh, is uh, older women, more than 65 years old. Uh, probably most of you know that women, we are uh, more affected for uh, heat uh, than, than men. But also men and women older than 75 years old who live alone. So there are a lot of social and contextual uh, factors that increase this vulnerability. So in the end, 
uh, this is a study that we made, um, uh, makes us know that the vulnerability is concentrated in nine of the 36 municipalities of the Barcelona area. This accounts almost for 20% of, the, of this population. And these municipalities are the ones that uh, are, we are, for example, the, the Besos River, Badalona, San Adria, Santa Coloma del Besos, and also Barcelona, obviously, some neighborhoods of Barcelona, not the whole Barcelona, and also some municipalities in the Llobregat area, Hospitalet, um, Cornellà, etc. But not all the neighborhoods, because uh, very often we think that uh, where uh, the poorest people do live, there we are going to find more vulnerable people. But as Karma was saying really fast, where uh, some years ago community intervention, interventions were made, for example, like uh, rehabilitation of households, we know that these people is now less vulnerable to, to this uh, heat, to this high temperature. So we also need to learn about good experiences to, to spread, spread them these next years. And just to finish, about health, um, more specifically. We studied this, vulnerable, this vulnerability index, but at the metropolitan scale, we don't have health data. Barcelona has health data. The regional government, they have health data. Uh, before, uh, it was said that uh, how much it is, uh, how much important it is to have access to share this data. So I think that we have the data in Europe, we have a lot of potential of capacity with this data, but we, are, we need to improve governance to share this data and to, to make policies and to make action. And I think this, today is a good day and this is a good force to ask for this also. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my next question is for Jose Maria. Um, what, in your view, is, is you know, can we do to make the Lancet Countdown in Europe uh, report and exercise more useful at the subnational and local level? So, just just give me half a minute to, to say that as a, when I in 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, when I, I did receive a call from uh, Nick White at that time, director of the Lancet. Global countdown saying, Joseph, we are starting a new platform in Europe. Would you like to join a small team to build that? And I said, Oh, sure. It has been an immense privilege. Now at home, everybody knows that the Thursdays there is a Lancet meeting in my office. Uh, and this has been a great privilege. So uh, thank, thank you to all the team for the opportunity to participate. Uh, and, and to answer your question, I would, I would take the, the point that uh, Maria Romanello made to say, so more than 10 years ago, uh, we, we we, 10 years ago, we realized that there was, climate change was the, the biggest uh, global health threat. Uh, and now we realize that this is the biggest uh, global health opportunity. Uh, and I think that um, when the Lancet Countdown took the decision to move to the regional platforms, and now seeing the regional platforms developing, I think we are entering in a new reality. And this new reality is a reality with an opportunity to interact locally with the policy makers, with the governments. Uh, this is, uh, we, we know this, all these indicators to be useful for policies need to be adapted to the local realities. And here is where I, I think we have the opportunity. And I am tremendously thankful to the organizations that uh, we have today here from Catalonia, the ones in the table. Uh, there are other ones here that are not at the table, the, the Sustainable Development Council with Arnau Keral here. Uh, I think that uh, uh, what, what I see as opportunity for the future, and I, I firmly believe that this is going to happen in the other regions in the world, is that we need to find the ways how we can make the Lancet countdown useful for your institutions and for your policies. And, and this is an opportunity. Maybe with the indicators we have, it may be incorporating new indicators. Uh, obviously, we are entering in the domain of subnational data, uh, but also at the more local granularity of the data. And, and here, I mean, it's, uh, I think it should be there for, for the next years uh, because this is what it's going to multiply the influence of the Lancet countdown. Yeah, thank you.
Thank you. No, I absolutely agree. Um, and, and Neil, uh, what do you see are the sort of resources we're going to need to address the health impacts of climate change? Uh, how much do we know about what the amounts involved are and what are the sort of concrete steps we should be thinking of to, to, to basically deliver the financial mechanisms to get there? Well, uh, your, the work we have just done has in, helped us in some respects to try and answer this question. Uh, we haven't, uh, we've not, in a sense, only touched the surface because we've, in some of the work we've seen that uh, resources uh, allocated to early warning systems res uh, have a, an extremely high rate of return. Uh, the amounts involved are insignificant, but the benefits that we get by doing so are even larger, by sometimes by an order of magnitude. So there is a lot to be said from the work that is ongoing, that we can allocate resources here, and we can justify these to departments in governments that are really short of cash. We can say, look, you really ought to do this because it has a tremendous benefit to cost ratio. But there are other areas too where we can, we can show that uh, the benefits are extremely high uh, and this is more related to the areas of mitigation where the, if we take action to reduce uh, uh, the carbon intensity of our economy, the carbon footprint, uh, we talked about uh, of course from electricity but also from mobility and uh, from um, diet, uh, th there are actions there that also require budgets, that require expenditure, uh, but if you undertake them, they will pay for themselves quite clearly and quite well. That work is still ongoing. I think we need to do more on that. We haven't quite uh, got into the detail of that, but we've kind of hinted at it in various bits of work that we've done. So we have time for a few questions from the audience. Uh, any uh, burning questions for our panelists? Mark? Uh, thanks a lot. It's a great exercise. And you know, we're all here to that things are happening. But sometimes what I see is, I think, a person on the normal people, that probably not, are probably not as engaged or aware of the issues or, and I wonder how what we can do actually or how to measure the, the, the kind of awareness, attitude, uh, perception of for needs of change, uh, how people change uh, within the Lancet countdown because it's actually people that need to change but you know very few of your indicators are are related to that and that's where things need to need to be done, I think. So I wonder, the panel, if they have any view on this uh, specific issue. Uh, if you don't mind me jumping in there, um, and I absolutely agree, and I think what we do know from the working group looking at engagement is that in Europe, most people are absolutely aware of climate change. They know about it. It's not a controversial topic, but they don't engage in pro-climate behaviors, and this is an area where we need more research and this is an area of focus that we have in the Catalyze project, which will generate new evidence, which we hope will then give us uh, the grounds to develop new indicators to really track that. Uh, but I open it up if the panel has anything to add. No, absolutely agree. I think this is a, an area pr the, probably many changes that are relevant are happening, and, and it's very difficult to know the magnitude and, and the distribution of, the, of these changes. Uh, so I think that this goes also to the, I mean, we, we need an effort to identify where are opportunities for new indicators and which indicators should be. And we need the infrastructure to develop these indicators. But ju just let me to put an example of something that I, I think it illustrates the relevance of these changes that there was, uh, uh, that as I wanted to comment, the, the responsibility of the medical community or the health community in Oberon. No? But we have all the College of Physicians in Catalonia have agreed in a position a statement that it's called Our Health, Our Planet, that it makes very explicit references to that. Well, the same at the Spanish level. There is a, a, a Spanish Association of Medical Doctors Against Climate Change that is uh, hosted by the 
uh, Federation of Colleges of Physicians in Spain. So, I mean, this is just a caveat. Do, do, do we need an indicator that traces how much these organizations, which are crucial, are incorporating climate change as a crucial element of their visions? I mean, uh, if yes, how do, how do we let, but I'm sure it's plenty of infrastructures in, uh, and, uh, and I hope that I'm sure that the, we have a good opportunity with a cluster of projects that, that you showed with uh, Ida Alert and, and uh, Catalyze and the other projects, and, and, and many of them probably have some efforts to improve indicators in monitoring changes of awareness. Can we? Just a comment, a small comment, that I think that individual indicators can be good, but at the end, the most important is the context, no? and, and the context, we have to change the context, because energy policies, mobility policies, all these kind of policies, if they don't change, it's difficult that people change. But, but I believe that at, at the end, policies are uh, marked by, by citizens, because citizens are pushing, the are pushing the political agenda. Therefore, I understand that uh, individual behavior is important, but I would center more in the context than in individuals. Can I one? Because you made actually a comment earlier this week, uh, Carmen, we were in another meeting in relation to climate change that very few people are willing to give up their car. Here in, in Barcelona, you were mentioning that uh, as kind of one measure. I don't know if you could uh, elaborate on that by any chance? Because you did some work on this, is my understanding. Well, I explained that um, in the meetings that we have had with the citizens. Uh, on climate change that in general people understand uh, about climate change, they know and they know the necessity that cars are not good for our health. But at the end, everyone wants a car. And this is, this is the contradiction that, that we say, yes, I understand that cars are not good, but I want a car in my house. And then this is, this is the things that are not so, so easy to do. It's the policies in Barcelona to reduce cars are related with all of this, because if everybody was uh, in agree, it, was, it would be very easy, but politicians are in the middle of citizens, uh, researchers, uh, and, and their beliefs as policy makers, and all this, and also the lobbies. Lobbies are there, because car lobbies are, are there, are, and, all of this, and all of these are, are pushing the political agenda, and I, I said this, that this is not so clear, that everyone, everybody wants to reduce the cars in the city. Ed. For example, in England, you have in Oxford some kind of big park, parking place. The people uh, who are go coming from, uh, like from outside of the city, big cities, they leave cars and they very have uh, very good uh, transport, public transport infrastructure. And I think here is still missing something even to do on this because people even do not have where to leave their cars before entering to the city. Another point wanted to add also for awareness, it's important to work also in education. So educational sector, together medical, I think here we have transdisciplinary approach. Thank you. So, I'm sorry, the question was about the role of education in this, I think. The role of education, because awareness comes from small children. If you start to educate them in kindergartens, at schools, they are uh, they are growing future citizens whom you need to educate to change it, okay. yes? Uh, would anyone like to comment on... Okay, please, Anna. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I, I am fortunate because I work also in the educational program of the metropolitan area where more than 60,000 people per year get in the program and we have studied that and look for a, information and it's very difficult to measure the impact of an individuals and we have a lot of doubts about uh, asking individuals uh, for a change. I mean, the change is not only in every person but it's a uh, social uh, change, it's a structural. So now with the Generalitat de Catalunya and Ajuntament de Barcelona we are looking for how to measure this collective transformation, how to measure this planned transition, and I think that the Lancet countdown, yes, probably it's, it's very interesting to integrate this 
very difficult to find indicators about these more collective or changes that affect communities, not only individuals. Tony, if yeah, there are like, last question. <laughs> no, it's not a question, it's just a comment and a suggestion. Uh, thank you, obviously, for all, uh, specifically on the issue of uh, local change and the theory of change at the local level as has been addressed. We are about to have local elections very soon. Mm -hmm. And that's a test, again, for all of this. So I think all the different stakeholders should try to remind, to, to remind them to somehow put pressure on how political programs, which of course is not political uh, governance at the end, but at least the programs that citizens will vote for, not vote for, how all these issues are reflected and, and approached by the different political options. So I think we are one step more, or one opportunity more, as was said, to, to try to bring this in, in the, in the decision-making agenda with the citizens, of course, so just out of uh, convenience and out of the opportunity that we have here in Catalonia very soon. Yeah. Any response? <laughs> no? Okay. Well, in the interest of time, I'm afraid we'll have to close the, close the session, but um, it's really been great, I think, to hear from the mix of you know, local governments, public administration, uh, research, uh, and uh, thank you very much for, uh, for being with us today. So. to our final uh, session, which is a recorded uh, statement from the uh, deputy mayor. Do we have that video ready to go? Bon dia a totes i a tots. En primer lloc, demanar-vos disculpes perquè no puc acompanyar-vos en aquestes jornades, però sí que us vull traslladar que des de la ciutat de Barcelona creiem que és molt important que estigueu fent aquestes jornades, aquesta conferència a Barcelona perquè necessitem que des de la ciència ens ajudeu a construir aquesta ciutat del segle XXI que necessitem perquè, perquè la gent vulgui viure i pugui viure a, a les nostres ciutats. El primer que vull fer és compartir amb vosaltres el repte enorme que tenim des de la ciutat de Barcelona com des de la resta de ciutats europees en combatre els greus i alarmants nivells de contaminació que patim encara malgrat totes les actuacions que estem fent i també explicar-vos des d'on estem treballant aquestes actuacions per tal de revertir aquesta situació que ens emmalalteix, no? que ens genera aquesta situació greu de salut. I algunes de les coses per compartir amb vosaltres vinculat a això són des d'on nosaltres fun fu fonamentem aquestes uh, polítiques, aquestes actuacions. Nosaltres tenim tota una sèrie de treballs que es desenvolupen des de diferents centres de recerca a la nostra ciutat, importantíssims, amb els que comptem quotidianament per avançar amb aquest objectiu, per veure on hem de fer més i de quina manera som més eficaços i eficaces a l'hora de revertir aquesta situació de contaminació. I també tenim una agència pública pròpia, l'Agència de Salut Pública, que ens ajuda a veure precisament aquestes dades i aquesta informació. Però principalment jo vull compartir amb vosaltres tres dades que són les que han fonamentat tota aquesta actuació i tota aquesta estratègia de Superilla Barcelona que estem desenvolupant a tots els barris per aconseguir reduir d'una vegada per totes la greu contaminació que pateix Barcelona. I la primera dada és la de les morts prematures que pateix la ciutat. Estem parlant de mil morts prematures que sabem que reduint la contaminació es podrien evitar i per tant que podríem salvar vides. Una dada importantíssima. La segona és que la majoria dels centres educatius de les escoles de la nostra ciutat, on van els infants de Barcelona a estudiar cada dia moltes hores, estan, una de cada quatre, estan per sobre dels límits legals de diòxid de nitrogen. Per tant, estan respirant un aire contaminat que, des que després els influeix en el seu propi desenvolupament com a, com a persones, com a, no, el desenvolupament cognitiu, per exemple, que és un dels estudis també que ha marcat més aquestes polítiques i posar l'atenció en les escoles. I una altra dada també rellevant és què és el que emet aquesta contaminació, no? des d'on eh, surt aquesta contaminació, doncs des dels cotxes, des del trànsit rodat. Sabem que la font més important a la nostra ciutat d'emissió d'aquest diòxid de nitrogen i de partícules ve dels cotxes. Per tant, per nosaltres, 
Això és el que ha fonamentat, com us deia, aquesta estratègia de superior a Barcelona, que bàsicament el que planteja és revertir aquesta situació d'injustícia. Injustícia en molts termes. D'una banda, perquè volem generar una nova manera de viure a la ciutat, una manera nova de moure'ns. El segle XX ha estat, de forma prioritària, ha protagonitzat un disseny urbà i un model urbà centrat en el cotxe, producte també de les pressions que ha pogut fer a la indústria automobilística i per això se'ns ha dit compreu-vos un cotxe, moveu-vos un cotxe i a la ciutat planifiqueu carrers on hi puguin passar i aparcar cotxes. Això és el que volem canviar i per això ens hem marcat un objectiu. El 2024 ha d'haver-hi una reducció del 25% dels cotxes que circulen per la ciutat, per tota la ciutat. I per això estem fent moltes polítiques que van de forma conjunta i que en primer terme el que es fixen és en revertir aquesta injustícia en l'espai públic, aquesta injustícia especial. El que necessitem és carrers que prioritzin que posin de protagonistes a les persones, als nens i nenes, a la gent gran, a les dones, aquells que hem estat històricament exclosos d'aquest model urbà i d'aquest disseny urbà, que s'ha basat principalment en homes blancs que tenen cotxe, que tenen una sèrie de condicions que fan que necessitin aquest espai públic destinat a que aparquin o a que passin cotxes. Per tant, volem reconquerir aquest espai públic que és nostre que no pot ser que el 60% estigui destinat precisament als cotxes i, per tant, el que volem és que hi hagi un de cada tres carrers de tota la trama central de la ciutat per on passen quotidianament més de 350.000 vehicles, des de l'Eixample fins a Sant Martí, que realment aquest espai torni a la ciutadania i que un de cada tres carrers siguin eixos verds, siguin carrers diferents, on realment la persona, l'individu, el veí o veïna pugui caminar tranquil·lament sentint-se que aquell espai li correspon, que això ens ajudi precisament a aconseguir aquest objectiu de reducció del 25% de la mobilitat. I lligat a això, precisament, hem posat en el centre, amb aquest urbanisme feminista que estem fent per posar en el centre la gent, la vida, allò que ens permet estar en una ciutat, és posar també en el centre les escoles. El fet que els nostres infants han estat oblidats del model de ciutat, ara volem que siguin també protagonistes. Per tant, les escoles és un espai a partir del qual configurem aquestes noves relacions i per això el 2023 haurem aconseguit una fita, que és que una de cada tres escoles haurà estat pacificada en els seus entorns. I això ens permet arribar a gairebé 200 escoles que hauran tingut una actuació. L'objectiu és que no volem deixar cap escola sense aquesta pacificació, però ja aconseguint que aquest terç de les escoles de la nostra ciutat estigui absolutament transformat per garantir que hi passin menys cotxes i que aquests nens i nenes hagin de suportar menys la contaminació. Aquest programa de Protegim les Escoles és un programa central de Barcelona que va lligat amb Superilla i, per tant, amb el que fem en tot l'espai públic, arribant a tots els barris. No només actuem, com us deia, en el centre de la ciutat per on passen tots aquests vehicles, per on es va configurar una xarxa bàsica que pràcticament en alguns punts semblen autopistes urbanes. Desfer això no només passa per aquesta part, sinó també per arribar a tots els barris que conformen Barcelona, a Sant Andreu, a Sants, a Gràcia, a tota la ciutat necessitem actuacions de la mateixa categoria de pacificació i de garantir que realment el primer sigui posar en el centre la salut perquè des de Barcelona hem triat clarament. Entre negacionisme i ciència, volem ciència, perquè per nosaltres el principi és fer de Barcelona una ciutat saludable, on voler i on poder viure, i per tant aquestes són les polítiques que avui estem tirant endavant, que volem que facin un salt qualitatiu en els propers anys i que realment configurin Barcelona una ciutat on poder viure, perquè tenim lloguers assequibles i tenim accés a l'habitatge, però sobretot una ciutat que no ens emmalalteix, una ciutat que ens permet desenvolupar el nostre projecte de vida amb la nostra família, amb qui nosaltres vulguem i que permet tirar endavant una ciutat que té futur, que cuida el seu futur. Així que moltes gràcies per haver escollit Barcelona per fer aquesta conferència, per fer aquestes xerrades, aquesta jornada, per ajudar-nos a contribuir en aquesta ciència, en buscar més informació, més dades, perquè ho fem millor, i oferir-vos que Barcelona sempre us acollirà, que Barcelona és casa vostra, perquè Barcelona vol ser una ciutat de ciència, una ciutat que lluita precisament per garantir que som una ciutat del segle XXI.
So thank you very much. We would like, now like to uh, close the event and invite you all to join us downstairs for some lunch. And I would just like to say my great thanks to The Lancet Public Health for making the publication of our report possible, to The Lancet, to The Wellcome Trust, to the Environment Agency, and to the Idea Alert and Catalyze projects for supporting this collaboration, and particularly to Catalyze for supporting this launch event. And I'm so grateful for all of you for being here. Thank you very much. And I look forward to joining you downstairs. Thank you.